Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first international speaker session of this semester. My name is Laura Cabrera, and I'm the leader of the research group in general surgery and subspecialties here at Universidad del Bosque. Our goal as a group is to ensure that every aspiring surgeon has the opportunity to connect with like-minded individuals, both locally uh, in Colombia and internationally. We're hoping to set the agenda for the future of surgery. It is a pleasure to host our first, first international and bilingual conference and to have such a great speaker to start this new section in, in our group. I'm joined by Valerie Moreno, our research committee leader. Uh, we are delighted to introduce Dr. Dominic Verbourg. Thank you, Laura. So Dr. Dominique, who is currently a student at the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto. He has also a dual degree at John Hopkins Blomberg School of Public Health and also completed the Paul Farmer Global Surgery Fellowship at the Program in Global Surgery and Social Change in Harvard Medical School. He introduced the concept of global cardiac surgery into the literature and he's also the co-founder of Incision, short for International Student Surgical Network, the world's largest surgical uh, global sur surgery trainee organization worldwide. So Dr. Dominique, I'm going to hand it over to you now. I'm hoping to kind of give you a bit of an introduction about what the field of global surgery is like and then specifically what all of you can do. But I do want to quickly start with what global surgery is and means because that is very important for you to grasp just to make sure that everybody's on the same page, but also that we understand really the dire situation that we're finding ourselves in around the world. Now, 5 billion people, which are a lot of zeros, 5 out of 7 people worldwide lack access to safe, timely and affordable surgical obstetric and anesthesia care when needed which is a ginormous number, five out of seven people that do not have the care that they needed or when they need it, um, which is a very big problem from a surgical perspective. Now, as I mentioned, I'm gonna give you a bit of a historical background, a bit of a current conceptualization of what global surgery is, and then specifically talk about the future as US trainees in global surgery. Now, the issue of global surgery is something that's only recently been recognized. We're talking about it today a lot. We're talking about it on social media and so forth, but it's a very, very young field. If we go back to, the, uh, to 1980, Dr. Hafen Mahler, who at the time was the boss, the director general of the World Health Organization, he was the first one to really speak up about it at an international level to say that this is a really serious manifestation of social inequity in healthcare. The issue that the fact that people don't have access to surgery when they need it is a big problem. But the people that he was speaking to at the time were surgeons and surgeons realized that. Or the people outside of the surgical community that didn't realize that. And so his moral call to action didn't really, um, really make a lot happen simply because he was preaching to the choir. And so we have to accelerate um, 28 years later, almost three decades later, when Dr. Paul Farmer and Dr. Jim Kim, um, both are not surgeons, they're infectious disease specialists. At the time, they were together at Harvard Medical School. Um, and you might know Dr. Farmer is one of the most well-known global health um, physicians, also the uh, founder of Partners in Health, and Dr. Jim Kim as a former president of the World Bank. Um, they at the time coined surgery and global surgery, the neglected stepchild of global health, to really state that them as non-surgeons really considered them as taking a view from beyond the OR and, and seeing it how surgery outside of the surgical community was really forgotten within global health. We think about infectious diseases, maternal and child health, um, kind of in the periphery, we're talking a bit about trauma, et cetera, but most of it was non-surgical and surgery was kind of forgotten. And it was interesting because Paul Farmer and Jim Kim are not infectious disease specialists. So you could say, okay, why do they take the initiative to actually try and address the issue of surgical care? And a few years later, um, Paul Farmer was uh, said to have told um, others that if they as infectious disease specialists treat patients with infectious diseases with antibiotics or um, prevent infectious diseases, et cetera, and the next day that patient crosses the street and then ends up in a car crash and really doesn't have access to surgical care, well, then that investment in healthcare has actually gone to waste. So what is really needed is a holistic health system that is not just able to care for 
patients with infectious diseases, maternal and child health, or surgical disease in silos, but really a strong health system is able to address all of that. And so we accelerate a bit later um, to 2015, when more and more of the sad reality that we're finding ourselves in became apparent. As I mentioned, 5 billion people do not have access to surgical care. And you can see here in, the, the, in red, really how dark it is, the darker it is, the more dire the situation are, and the fewer people who have access to surgical care. You can see where those areas are really concentrated. You have a bit in Central and South America, um, you have a bit in, um, in East Europe, but most of it, as you can see, is in Asia, East Asia, Southeastern Asia, um, South Asia, and then Sub-Saharan Africa. That's really where the biggest barriers are. But then, as you can see as well, in South America and Central America, there's also much um, left to do. And this is also reflected in the distribution of um, the surgical workforce per population. So you see here, it's kind of the converse, the greener it is, the darker green it is, the better, because it means that there are more surgeons, anesthesiologists, and obstetricians per population. And you see in Europe, in um, the US, in, for example, Brazil, Argentina, Australia, etc. it's quite well um, in terms of the number of surgeons, etc. available per population. But if we look at the same areas that were problematic, um, Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, and so forth, we're seeing those same disparities, and that's obviously related to access to care. Um, and unfortunately, the fewer surgeons there are, fewer anesthesiologists, obstetricians, the, lo the lower the life expectancy is. So it's hard, maybe hard to see here, but here you could kind of draw a line where um, the in, as the more surgical workers you have, especially when we come to the blue line, which is 20 specialist workers per 100,000 population, and eventually to 40, which is the gray line, the higher the life expectancy is, and the more uh, people can be saved simply because surgical care is available. And so 2015, because of that reason, um, because of the understanding of what the current realities are, has really been the golden year, and that is because of these three documents. On the far left, you have a document that came out of the World Bank, um, which is called Disease Control Priorities 3. Um, and it was very important because it was a series of volumes by the World Bank that showcases which interventions in healthcare, in any kind of specialty, so to say, um, is very cost effective to invest. So if I were to be a Minister of Health or I were to be a Minister of Finance, etc., and I have to consider which healthcare interventions are we going to invest in to get the best bang of our, of our buck, then these are some of the um, recommended interventions that they could consider. And before in DCP1 and DCP2, surgery was really not actually mentioned very superficially, um, but DCP3 had a, an entire volume, an entire long PDF, so you can say, especially the first one, so the first of the series dedicated to surgery. And it was a very important thing because it showcased things like cleft lip repairs, um, cesarean sections, open fracture repairs, hernia repairs, et cetera, et cetera. All of these interventions were very cost effective and it was now also telling ministries of health, governments, um, healthcare administrators, et cetera, that this is something to invest in. Now the middle one is potentially the one that you're a bit more familiar with, which is the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery, which kind of gave rise to all of the numbers that we're talking about, 5 billion people not having access to surgical care and some of the numbers that I'll share in just a second. Um, and it was really, really critical for the world to know what really are the gaps. Because when we say surgery is important in global health, oftentimes people would say, well, it's maybe not that important in comparison to infectious disease and so forth. But I'll show you just a second that it's actually, um, thanks to the numbers of the Lancet Commission, um, actually a fallacy. And then to the right, you have a very important policy document which came from the World Health Organization. And that was also in 2015, on May 26, 2015, when all the countries, all the ministries of health of the 194 countries affiliated with the World Health Organization came together and decided surgery and anesthesia care is an important component of universal health coverage. And if we want to make sure that all the people in a given country have access to basic emergency and essential care that they need, we also have to include surgery. And so this was a very pivotal year because of these three documents, because of the fact that we now know what the gaps are, we now know that there's commitment, and we now somewhat have a way forward um, to see how we can address this. 
Now, an important thing when we talk about access to surgical care, which I quickly want to mention is slightly conceptual, um, is that these 5 billion people aren't living in countries without surgical care, um, but they have no access to surgical care for a variety of reasons. And that could be because hospitals are too far. If you're living in rural Colombia and the hospital that is providing trauma care, cesarean sections, et cetera, are five hours away. And the only way that you can get there is to walk or take public transport that you can't afford, et cetera. You can't really have access to surgical care simply because you can't reach the hospital. Second thing then um, would be the issue of capacity. Even if you have a hospital available, you need to have the resources. You need to be able to have a surgeon that's able to do the surgery. You need to have an anesthesiologist. You need to have surgical sutures. Uh, maybe you need specific essential medicines, maybe you need um, uh, blood supplies, blood banks, maybe you need an intensive care unit, um, maybe you need um, certain equipment for uh, trauma repair, uh, for open fracture repairs, et cetera, et cetera. And so all of this is really necessary to actually speak about capacity. And the third thing would be the issue of safety. Even if we're able to perform surgery, it might not necessarily be safe because technically anybody could perform surgery, but that doesn't mean that it's safe and it's gonna save your life. In contrast, worse care can sometimes be even more dangerous than having no care at all. So we have to make sure that we're actually talking about um, safety within the operating room, within the facility. And then lastly and importantly is the affordability aspect. A lot of patients in low and middle income countries do not have extensive health coverage or health insurance. In South America, to a greater extent, the government is intervening and supporting patients um, with regards to access to healthcare and paying for healthcare, at least to, um, to some extent. Whereas in other countries, in low and middle income countries, patients have to either pay out of pocket or they have to pay great sums to actually get some form of health insurance. And so the affordability aspect, especially given that surgery is very expensive, is a critical component. And so all of the four of these have to be there to actually say, you have access to surgery or you do not. And so because of that, 5 billion people do not have access to surgical care right now. Now, as a result of that, one third of the burden of disease, so 28 to 30 percent of all the diseases that we can think about are surgical or require surgery at some point. As a result, every year, 18 million people die because of surgical conditions. And when we look at those 18 million and we count all the infectious diseases or when we count at least kind of the, the biggest infectious diseases like HIV, TB, and malaria, and we add them all together, we're seeing that five times as many people die from surgical conditions than HIV, TB, and malaria combined. And so really, surgery is a critical component of healthcare and having no access to surgical healthcare is going to result in never being able to attain universal health coverage. And so because of that, more and more understanding has come up of the fact of how really important surgery is. Now, to ensure that everybody in the world has access to emergency and essential surgical care, we need about $350 billion by 2030. Again, these are a lot of zeros. And when you see a hair on a picture, you'll think, okay, well, that's pretty hard to get. But at the same time, governments will have to invest because if they do not, then they uh, are estimated to lose much, much more because about 12.3 trillion US dollars is estimated to be lost in economic productivity and gross domestic product by 2030 by low and middle income countries if they do not invest in surgical healthcare. And so you can quickly see that we really, really need to care about surgical care in global health and policymakers, funders, etc., are also increasingly paying attention. And that's why I want to briefly speak about the present as well, just to kind of say that we've had 2015 as a golden year. It's now 2021. In the past six years, much has happened, but what exactly has happened? So when you look at, for example, PubMed and you type in global survey as a key term, you see a really big surge in publications ever since 2015. So I highlighted that 2015 to kind of give you a sense of the years that come after. And you see that every year is becoming more and more. 2021 is obviously still only halfway and we're already seeing that it already matches almost 2020. And so we're expecting that every year more and more global surgery research is going to be performed. And that's because more academics, more institutions, more researchers um, are interested in this, but also more and more people are actually funding global surgery research and are getting a better understanding of what it entails and what we have to do. 
But at the same time, there's also a lot of momentum happening at the national and international level. Countries themselves are committing to actual health policy plans to address the issue of access to surgical care through national surgical obstetric and anesthesia plans, which in brief are basically strategic plans for countries to say, this is where we are currently in terms of surgical health care. This is where we have to go and can go based on the resource that we have. And this is kind of the plans and the steps how we're going to do it in the next few years. For example, setting up X amount of training programs for general surgery, for example, investing in an emergency and essential surgical care package so that patients don't have to pay for those surgical procedures. For example, um, ensuring that there are more hospitals that are able to do cesarean sections in, let's say, rural Colombia or rural country anywhere, or rural part of a country anywhere. Um, and at the same time, international organizations like the World Health Organization, now the United Nations through the United Nations Institute for Training and Research and the Global Surgery Foundation are supporting countries and actually doing this, supporting them in creating these plans, supporting them by connecting them with other countries who've done a similar thing and supporting them in actually making sure these plans can be implemented with the right expertise, with hopefully the right funding and so forth. And so based on all of this, we can say that what Dr. Paul Farmer and Dr. Jim Kim said in 2008, that surgery is the neglected stepchild of global health, that might no longer be true. We can maybe say that it is no longer a neglected stepchild, but we have to recognize that much is still left to do because unfortunately this 5 billion people figure is still there. And so we kind of come to a very exciting um, development, despite the pandemic, very exciting developments in the recent years with regards to the fact that WHO is continuing to push the issue of um, global surgery on their agenda, is having countries report on their progress every two years and is ensuring that countries go to WHO and um, to the greatest extent possible at least give an update if they wish so. And luckily countries have done so thus far because um, in 2019, um, which is kind of the middle picture that you see there, um, they had a 1.5 page or update coming from the WHO telling the world, this is what countries are doing, this is what happening and so forth. And that was very encouraging because it showcased that countries are actually committing to this. WHO is actually committing to this. And in the years that have gone past, so in basically the past two years, um, that has continued so even despite the current pandemic um, because Pakistan has just recently last week launched its national surgical plan it's and so Nepal is currently going into discussions um, and many other regions in the world are currently still in the process of developing their plans but at the same time we're also seeing kind of a surprising tool come up with the power of social media which especially is the case with the current pandemic where we're noticing that social media can actually be very promising as a tool to actually achieve what we're able or what we want to achieve, especially as we're all living in somewhat of a virtual world. The examples I'm giving here are still from pre-pandemic, but it also kind of shows you already what the power of social media was. For those of you who don't know, Richard Horton, Dr. Richard Horton, he's the editor-in-chief of The Lancet, which is a very reputable journal. Um, and before he went to Geneva in Switzerland and went to speak and given uh, a speech to all ministries of health at the World Health Assembly, he asked people on Twitter, if you had the opportunity to go and stand there and speak for 10 minutes to all ministries of health uh, who are at the World Health Assembly, what would you say to them? What are the things that you care about? What are the things that are important? And people responded, people gave different comments of what they thought was important, why they thought it was important, why countries have to care about it, etc. And lo and behold, just a few days later, he went up, two days later, he spoke to all ministries of health, it was streamed all over the world, and he said one of his top five recommendations to all ministries of health was that we have to invest in safe surgery and anesthesia, because he also recognized and if we don't address that, we cannot attain universal health coverage. And what came after was also kind of a bunch of exciting events on social media as well as in real life, etc. that may seem very minor, may seem very small, but also um, have a very important impact that they last in the sense that the WHO, the UN, etc., etc., um, posted more and more on social media about the issue of safe surgery, about surgical obstetric and anesthesia care, about the Global Surgery Foundation, et cetera, et cetera. 
And people who are seeing this, people who care about primary health care, people who are community health workers, infectious disease specialists, ministries of health, government people, funders, etc. They might see it on Twitter, on their newsletters, etc. And then suddenly associate these organizations with surgery, whereas before they only thought about WHO doing something about infectious diseases, United Nations doing something about economic development and so forth. And yet suddenly they're starting to talk about surgery. Um, and so that really kind of primes them into thinking differently about why is surgery important and who is involved. Um, and at the same time, um, events like this, whether you're in person or whether you're online, can also be an opportunity to um, kind of reach an audience who normally wouldn't really be, uh, be interested in your topic. For example, people who don't really care about safe surgery and anesthesia, maybe because they're in a very different field or maybe because they just don't know about it. Because for example, it is not on the agenda. So in 2018, uh, which was a year um, just between two updates, because in 2017 and 2019, there were surgery updates at the WEHA, the World Health Assembly, but in 2018, there was no update. And there was also no other event. Nobody was talking about safe surgery at the WHO at that World Health Assembly. And thousands of people were together in Geneva. And yet five out of seven people in the world do not have access to safe surgery. And so I kind of provoked them. I said, okay, well, we're here with thousands. Imagine if every five out of seven people who are here does not have access to safe surgery. Will we then be talking about it? Well, currently we're talking about issues that are also important but in comparison are much less um, impactful, so to say, on a country or on a population level. And so that is not to say that we have to neglect other issues, but we can also not forget about access to safe surgery. And so global health and global surgery is obviously changing in terms of the dynamics, is changing in terms of prioritization. We're seeing more and more interest in the concept of global surgery and in the um, attention for surgery and surgical care as a whole within global health. And we're also seeing that with regards to research specific to global surgery. Now, um, a few years ago, we did an analysis of um, global surgery research between 1987 and 2017 to see whether over those three decades, um, mostly before, but also two years after the Lance Commission on Global Surgery, really who was doing research about global surgery? What does global surgery mean in this context? Um, who was doing research in or about surgery in lower middle income countries? Um, how was it driven, et cetera? And was it actually equitable? Um, and this was important because from a global health perspective beyond surgery, um, there were a lot of increasing calls about global health equity and a lot of evidence coming out that global health was mostly driven by high income country authors and encouragingly, we weren't seeing that to the same extent for global surgery, though there was a trend towards more um, high income country domination, so to say. Um, but encouragingly, there were a lot of low and middle income country authors as well involved in global surgery research, which is really what it should be. They should be the ones driving this because ultimately it's happening in their hospitals, in their countries. It has to be driven by their priorities, by their needs, et cetera. And so while the numbers seem to be a bit more encouraging than global health at large, obviously we have to make sure that the balance tips over to be mostly driven, if not entirely driven by low and middle income country authors and researchers. Um, and at the same time, we're also still seeing, um, fortunately, some other um, disparities within global health, especially when we're talking about um, the opportunities to, um, to do research abroad, to go for fellowships or to go to conferences abroad. And we have to make sure that within kind of the changing face of global health, within that context, within an increasing understanding of neocolonialism and the imbalances within global health and global surgery, that we actually move on forward in the, in the direction of reciprocity and global health and moving forward in regards to um, the kind of putting health equity, um, global health equity, both at the patient level and at um, the researcher and, and individual level central in terms of any kind of global health intervention, conference, research project, um, fund, and so forth. And so, um, especially during a pandemic, there have been a lot of calls, a lot of webinars, a lot of increasing attention for that, as we are all able to now attend all the same events online, whereas previously it was mostly dominated by high income country individuals who were able to go to Geneva, to the World Health Organization, or to New York for the United Nations, 
or go to conferences uh, in anywhere in the US or in Europe, et cetera, where typically those conferences are held. Whereas now that everything is virtual, we're getting increasing participation and getting an increasing understanding of really who is there, what do they have to share, and who have we been previously been excluding. And so um, hopefully that can continue as well beyond the pandemic. And so now the most important thing um, with regards to obviously you as the audience would be um, the concept of involving trainees and the youth in global surgery and really um, getting a grasp of what U.S. trainees can do to actually get involved even when you're not yourself um, doing the clinical work, so to say, and being the ones who are operating um, and so forth. And so that's why I want you to think more non-clinical than clinical in this context, because there are a lot of opportunities for you to already get involved and have a great impact, simply because surgery is much more than what is happening within the operating room, but also has to do with regards to the policies that are in place, what the countries are funding, um, who has access to care, who does not have access to care, why do they not have access to care, how can we address that, and so forth. And so there's three main points that I want to briefly discuss, being one, advocacy. It's really about spreading awareness, spreading the message, letting people know what it is. It's peer education and kind of gearing towards the snowball effect so that you, when you go, uh, when you log off after this event, you text a friend and you say, hey, I just heard about global surgery. If you don't know, this is what it's about, etc." I encourage you to tell somebody else. And if everybody tells somebody else, then quickly, more and more people will know about it, and suddenly you have an entire network um, that knows about it, that's interested about it, that tells other people, and so forth. And then thirdly is really the issue of research. If the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery wasn't there, we would probably not have found out that 5 billion people do not have access to surgical care. We would probably not have figured out that countries are potentially losing $12.3 trillion in potential economic growth if they don't invest in surgical care. And so research is really, really critical to understand what are the gaps, where do we need to go, and how can we go there? And so these three points, as I mentioned, are things that US trainees can get involved with. And as I said, the first point is advocacy, is, is really the concept of spreading awareness and really getting more involved with regards to health policy um, on, on kind of the, whether it's within your institutions, letting people know what global surgery is or kind of um, supporting health policy education or all the way to going to the government and being involved with the World Health Organization initiatives like that um, to ensure that the policies that are driving global health, that are driving healthcare, that are driving funding decisions for um, who can access what and what is uh, prioritized are all related to advocacy to a great extent. And so um, a, last year we coined the, the theme of surgeon advocate from a cardiac surgery perspective, but it pertains quite largely um, to global surgery at large with regards to the fact that things like health policy education, being involved in societies, whether it's your own society at your university, whether it's a student society like Incision Columbia, or whether it's a surgical society once you become a resident or a staff, are all great ways to kind of get involved with it and pushing um, towards more health policy involvement from the society because countries, governments, they listen to a society because those are bodies representatives of an entire community. Your surgical society in Colombia represents surgeons in Colombia and if that surgical society goes to the government, goes to the Ministry of Health and says, okay, well, our patients cannot afford surgical care or we have too few surgeons or we um, have this issue or that issue, then this might be something that the Ministry of Health can pay attention to because they know that this is the representative voice of the surgeons in Colombia. Um, but at the same time, we also have to kind of give trainees, um, medical students, residents, as well as attending surgeons, obstetricians, anesthesiologists, other healthcare workers, the opportunity to get um, broader involvement in health policy, whether that is in, in kind of getting opportunities of health policy related fellowships, um, research programs, research degrees, health policy degrees, etc. and getting a better understanding of what health policy really means because it can be a pretty vague concept if it is something that you haven't heard about before um, because typically or at least from my perspective I had not never heard about that in my medical training simply because it tends to fall outside of the scope of clinical work. And um, then the fourth thing 
um, is with regards to community engagement. And it is really important for mostly people in high income countries or in, in big cities and upper middle income countries is to not just think about global surgery as something that's far away as, as issues pertaining to surgical care per, um, only related for people who live in uh, low and lower income countries or lower middle income countries um, who live in rural areas, et cetera, because oftentimes in our community, there's also patients who cannot access it. There might be unconscious biases whereby some patients get better care than others. Maybe there's an issue of um, the fact that some people are able to pay for better care than others, et cetera. Um, and so we really have to also consider what are some of the issues within our own communities. And then lastly would be the issue of unconscious biases from an equity perspective to ensure that um, both on, in terms of gender equity and in terms of racial equity, as well as in terms of any form of equity, that we're treating our patients, treating our colleagues, treating our trainees, our attendings, et cetera, um, equitably and ensuring that there's no disparities with regards to that or no unconscious, unconscious biases and inequity that is prevailing um, because of, um, because of how the system is structured. And so there's really um, various opportunities for you in terms of an advocacy perspective to get um, more involved in that. Um, and a great example of, of trainee involvement in global surgery is actually coming from Colombia. Um, a few years ago, uh, Colombia, and, and still is, but a few years ago when it, the plan was really starting, when the end of in Colombia, the planning for that was really starting, Incision Colombia was a really critical player there in the sense that they were attending those meetings. Um, the, the different stakeholders who were there at the meetings um, from surgeons all the way to the Ministry of Health, um, international partners like WHO, like the Harvard Program in Global Surgery and Social Change, et cetera, were there. But they had also invited Incision Colombia because they were interested in hearing what trainees had to say, what trainees could do in the future with regards to access to surgical healthcare in Colombia, because ultimately, as I said at the start of this talk, when we are creating a plan, we're implementing that plan. Once that plan is implemented, once we are actually doing it, the trainees who were there when they were drafting it, they're the ones who are going to be implementing it. They have to make sure that they are feeling accountable, that they feel related to what is being implemented, that they're actually gonna do it. Because if that's not the case, if you're just going to completely neglect that, then that plan is never going to be implemented because it might not be relevant, it might not be applicable, it might be very conflicting with what their perceptions or their training or their perceived needs are. Um, and so Incision Columbia has been very influential and this is a great kind of example of how trainees really are involved or can be involved um, with regards to health policy and advocacy. And from a peer education perspective, you have a variety of uh, organizations who are really trying to do that or trying to get involved with health policy or trying to get involved with peer education or trying to host conferences in person, online and so forth. Um, and one example of that would be International Student Surgical Network, or abbreviated Incision, um, which is an international network, is a global network, but it has country um, level organizations like, for example, Incision Colombia in Colombia. And their goal is really to bring trainees from medical students very early on in medical school all the way to senior residents, bring them all together um, and uh, all of them interested in global surgery, obviously trying to bring them all together, and really be that voice for students and uh, junior doctors and trainees in global surgery to ensure that similar to surgical societies, we have a body, we have a voice of trainees who are saying, okay, well, Lance Commission says this, the WHA resolution says that, et cetera. Once you reach your goals in 2030, or once you're working towards your goals in 2030, we're there, we're the ones doing this. So we have to be here now as well. And so in, Incision really has been trying to do that in a variety of ways at the country and international level. Um, we started with uh, the in Incision Global Surgery Symposium in 2018, which was in Belgium. Um, the second one was in 2019 in Rwanda, in Africa, um, in the capital of Rwanda, in Kigali. Um, and the 2021 was actually supposed to be physically in Bogota, in Colombia, in 2020. But then, unfortunately, COVID-19, the pandemic hit. And so it was postponed, but eventually held um, virtual online last fall, or like the fall of 2020. Um, it was a great, a very exciting event. And I'm, I'm hoping that some of you were able to attend it. 
Um, but it kind of was a great example of how students and, and, and residents, trainees at large, were able to adapt to the new reality of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we're still pushing through and stating that despite COVID-19, surgery doesn't stop. People still have surgical needs and that will always continue. And so at the country level, a variety of initiatives have been held at individual universities, um, at conferences within communities and so forth. You see pictures here on the left bottom from Haiti and the right top in Rwanda and the right bottom uh, in Canada on the left top in Somaliland. And you have um, groups, uh, incision groups all across the world here. Again, Rwanda, Tanzania, Mexico, Sierra Leone, Singapore, etc from all around the globe who are hosting these events are actually advocating for global surgery within their universities, within their communities, with their surgical societies, with their attendings, with their ministries, et cetera, um, really saying that, okay, we might be students, but we are a strong boys and we're seeing what the realities are for patients that we care for, for our families, for our future. And we really think that more needs to be done about safe surgical care. And every year on May 25th um, of, of every year, um, Incision hosts Global Surgery Day, which is kind of a dedicated day to global surgery to really unite everybody in the field of global surgery to, to advocate for the issue of safe surgical obstetric and anesthesia care. And it's typically a moment where mostly online people are rallying and speaking about, up about the issue of global surgery. But at the same time here and there, different countries and different student groups and organizations are also hosting in-person events to actually ensure that we collectively are a very strong voice and are speaking up about this matter. And this is also increasingly being noticed outside of the surgical community because there's been many events where um, we've met individuals who were, for example, working in maternal and child health, working in primary health care, working in infectious disease, etc. cetera, have actually really noticed what Incision is doing, what trainees are doing in terms of speaking up and are really impressed and also feel empowered by the fact that the future of the operating room isn't just sitting back and waiting until they're surgeons, but they're also already taking the matters in their own hands and already speaking up to ensure that once they become surgeons, that they can continue the work that they've been doing for so long. Now, a quick plug is that um, there are a variety of kind of subspecialty initiatives, such as, for example, global neurosurgery, global anesthesia, global pediatric surgery, global cardiac surgery, um, that have kind of come up. And within global surgery, we obviously always try to stay health systems wide and try to acknowledge the fact that we don't have to silo ourselves. Um, but obviously different individuals have also different career paths, different interests, and ultimately it's also hard to completely remain unsiloed simply because of our different interests and clinical expertise. Um, and so some of these initiatives really try to take that health systems perspective but apply it to specific um, subspecialties, such as, for example, the Global Cardiac Surgery Initiatives, which really tries to unite individuals who are interested in cardiac surgery, take those same concept of health systems and embedding that within other specialties, together with other specialties, to try, to try and address the issue of the fact that barely anybody worldwide, six billion people worldwide, does not have access to safe cardiac surgical care. So barely anybody, less than two billion people have access to cardiac surgical care. And so you're seeing that there's quite some variation within different conditions, despite the fact that, for example, for global cardiac surgery, cardiovascular diseases are the leading cause of death worldwide. And so those issues, despite being lesser acknowledged within kind of the broader global health movement, are also issues that we have to address um, collectively. Um, and so this is kind of um, the social media pages. Um, but then, as I mentioned previously, and, and this is a great example, this webinar series, this lecture series of really the world that we really live in is a virtual world. There's an opportunity for us to come together even though we are apart. Even though that during the past year and a half, conferences have been canceled due to the pandemic, we were unable to travel and we had to adjust to the world of Zoom. We had to see each other face to face through a camera behind our computers in our own homes. But at the same time, as uncomfortable as it was at the start for people to adjust, especially given the uncertainty, um, it also gave one big benefit. It also brought about one big benefit. And that is that 
conferences, these opportunities, workshops, etc., all became way more equitable. Whether you were from Colombia, whether you were from Australia, whether you were like me and you were in Belgium or um, you were training in Canada or you were somewhere in Japan or India, it doesn't matter where in the world you were. If you had internet, you were able to connect to an event, you were able to come where previously you had to pay money to travel, you had to pay or get visas, you had to get accommodation, you had to get time off, et cetera, et cetera. And so oftentimes people from lower middle countries, they just simply could not afford, they could not go away for so long and so forth. Whereas now they were there, they were sharing their experience of resource constraints. They were able to listen from experts in the field, regardless of which specialty we're talking about, regardless of what matter we were talking about. Oftentimes they were specialists themselves that now finally could able to share their voice because they didn't have to go away from their country or from their home. And so this really gave us an opportunity to share more, to learn more, to hear more. Um, and hopefully beyond the pandemic, as conferences start again, this will be to an extent uh, maintained that we're moving more towards hybrid formats that allow more people to attend, even if virtually, allow more people to learn, even if remote. Now, then the last point, I, I spoke a bit about advocacy, I spoke a bit about education. I wanna close with the, the notion of research, which is a critical pillar of global surgery and which is oftentimes something that might feel a bit less um, innate or a bit less comfortable as a student because you might not know where to start, you need kind of guidance from your mentors, et cetera. Um, and that is totally normal, but there are a lot of opportunities for you to already get started. It all starts with an ID, whether somebody gives you the ID or whether you observe it, you notice that literature doesn't describe it, you notice that you've treated a patient and there was an issue that you can't find the answer to anywhere, or you notice that within your country there's a certain issue with regards to surgical patients that isn't addressed and you think it might be interesting to figure out more. Now, with that comes the second concept of consideration, really think about what could really be at the ground of this, what could be the issue, what could be the solution, um, what are some things that we have to consider, why has nobody else answered that before, and this is actually important. And then the third thing, which is arguably most important, is really collaborating with fellow students, with mentors, with mentees, with people abroad, with people in other institutions in your country and so forth, and collectively trying to address that. Now, there are unfortunately some issues that always come about, um, and that is that some aspects of global surgery um, and even global surgery at large might still be um, somewhat neglected despite the momentum that is going on, simply because people might not know about it. People might think that surgery is not important. People might think that um, in this specific example, cardiac surgery is not important until they figure out why 18 million people die every year from surgical conditions, so it must be bad. 18 million people die from cardiovascular diseases, of which a considerable proportion is surgical, so it must be bad. And so it's really that issue of advocacy that, that is there critical. There's the issue of research showcasing that it is actually critical. Um, second would then also be um, the, the issue of really, what is it? Like, what are the pieces to the puzzle? If we have a research question, we have to find the answer. If we're observing an issue, we have to figure out why is that issue there? And we have to figure out how can we actually solve that? When we're talking about global surgery, we're saying, for example, in my community, half of the people can't access surgical care. We have to figure out why is it? Is it because they live too far? Is it because they can't afford it? Is it because there's too few surgeons? And we have to then figure out how can we address that? Do we need more hospitals? Do we need more surgeons? Do we need specific health insurance? Is there a specific type of procedure that is more common than others, et cetera, et cetera. And then the third thing is really kind of making sure that policymakers, funders, et cetera, are noticing this issue and are actually paying attention to this and then actually also um, addressing that matter. So that's more from the policy and advocacy perspective um, is really important both at the national level as well as internationally. Um, and so all of that um, kind of comes with the fact that research comes in many shapes or forms. Research can start all the way from an expert opinion, simply because you have a certain set of information or a certain set of expertise about an issue, all the way to um, lower levels of information or lower um, levels on this pyramid, so we say. 
um, that goes up to more um, valid and more stronger quality of evidence that is pooling different evidence together or has stronger study designs. So as students, it's oftentimes much easier to kind of get started with, with the lower level simply because of the fact that it is more lower hanging fruit, simply such as letters to the editor, expert opinions together with a, with a mentor of yours, a case report that there might be, or just literature reviews, uh, which is more on the top, but allows you to kind of explore the literature and do something from your own home. Um, and I do encourage you to kind of explore that because as trainees, you come from very different backgrounds. It might be that you have done a degree in something else. It might be that you live in a part of the country or have grown up in a part of the country, which gives you a very different perspective. It might be that your societal involvement or your involvement with um, this initiative is giving you a different perspective than people have in different countries or in different institutions and can also really allow you to shed some light on an issue on something that you feel very um, very strongly about, very um, passionate about, for you to share that experience in a way that others might not be thinking about. And so I definitely encourage you to already kind of start thinking, what is it that interests you? What is it that you can bring? And so this is going to be my last slide before I open it for questions, um, is that I encourage you to reach out. Um, you're obviously taking a big first step in attending um, this webinar, hopefully the rest of the lectures in this series. Um, you are definitely encouraged to reach out to me if you have questions, but I encourage you to reach out to some of the other students who are on this call, reach out to some of the mentors that you have or some of the mentors that you would like to have at your institution or in your country, and uh, also share your experience. What have you observed? What are some things that you've been wondering? What are some things that you can do together to address these issues in global surgery? Um, I encourage you to read. The easiest thing there is is to read. Um, if you can access papers, that, that's even better. But there's a variety of open access literature that you can always start um, accessing and start reading. You can discuss it with people in your class. You can discuss it with friends, etc. You can try simply writing about it, trying to summarize it, try to structure an article as you generally would. Um, to kind of already prepare as you kind of get involved with research and repeat that process because all of that is really a matter of practice as it is um, as much about expertise because you can have all the expertise but if you don't know how to write nothing will come out you can know how to write and then once you get that expertise you can easily um, get everything out and so definitely try and practice that as well and um, then the third thing would be to start questioning things start to wonder whether the things that you're observing, whether they are what they are and whether they are what they should be. Oftentimes the things that we observe in terms of inequities in our health system, what we're observing in terms of what was commonly acceptable, but is increasingly understood um, that it is a very inequitable situation with regards to, for example, gender inequity within the surgical disciplines are things that we have to question and speak up about, about the issue that we have to ensure gender equity within a surgery. We have to ensure there's access to surgical health care for our patients. We have to start questioning why surgery is not part of global health traditionally um, and really think outside the box and wonder, okay, if this is an issue, but nobody has spoken about it, why is this and how can we start talking about this? How can we address this? And that's really how um, all of these things come together, where you're all coming together, sharing this with each other, discussing it with each other, questioning it, starting to write about it and so forth. Um, and really start with low hanging fruit, start with the easiest thing that you can start with. For example, a letter to the editor, you read a paper, and you feel very strongly about the fact that a paper is not correct or you feel that it's very correct and you've noticed something in your hospital or in your community or in your personal life or in, you've read something elsewhere and you say, well, yeah, this is great, but the author didn't mention it. And you can add that as well. Very simple thing. We can also start um, with some slightly higher, but still low hanging fruit like literature reviews. Reach out to a mentor, reach out to a professor and speak with them, see what are some of the opportunities and really try and, and practice that. And then the last point, um, which I can't stress enough, and, and maybe if you're very early on in your medical training, that might still be early, um, but as you go on, try and see what your interests are, whether it is clinically in terms of specialty, um, or whether it is within global survey with regards to specific topics, like for example, gender equity, like for example, health financing, health economics, um, surgical education, um, health policy, 
et cetera, et cetera. See what interests you and try to explore that further to really try and carve out your niche and really find something that you feel passionate about and you see yourself doing for the rest of your career. Because ultimately that is going to be very instrumental in kind of paving your path and allowing you to build that expertise, write more, discuss more, share more, find more like-minded people and really build your network within surgery. Um, and with that, I want to close. I want to open it for any questions that you might have, but I hope that this kind of gives you a bit of a picture of where Global Survey currently stands and really especially how you as medical students and residents can get involved and stay involved in Global Surgery and really make a change in the future of surgery in Colombia. Thank you again for having me and happy to answer any questions. Okay, doctor, thank you so much for the session. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you here and to make sure that every medical student around the world knows about lower surgery and its importance. So thank you so much. We have some questions, but Valerie? Ah, uh, yes, so now is the question time, but some students I would like to I encourage you to open up your mics and speak up. So now it's the time. Um, hi, Dr. Dominic. Um, Brandon Galvis. I'm a maxillofacial surgery resident. Um, first of all, excellent presentation. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, since you haven't had the experience of being a surgery resident both in the United States and in Canada, I want to ask you how different it is, you know, since uh, they have different health systems, um, how they were able to manage the outreach uh, for surgery for uh, patients and how they differ between these two health systems and how can we uh, learn from those systems so we can uh, look for ways to make a better health system here in Colombia and, or any undeveloped country. Yeah, thank you so much for your question. Um, so just as a bit of a disclosure, I am not a surgical resident yet. So I, I uh, am a graduate student. I did a master's in the US and, and a sort of global surgery fellowship. And so from kind of the health policy and global surgery perspective, I have that experience. Um, and in Canada, I'm currently pursuing my PhD. So I can't necessarily speak about the clinical aspect as much. Um, however, being involved in terms of health, health systems research and health services research, obviously I can speak more about that, um, which hopefully will answer your question. Um, so for those who are um, maybe not as familiar, the United States is not a single payer healthcare system. In the United States, patients who really cannot afford healthcare um, because they are, um, they, their income is not high enough, they get access to um, Medicaid, which is basically a way for them to get some form of, of nationally funded uh, health insurance, whereas others get it through their employers because they have a job and their, their employers pay for it. Um, some others, they're able to pay for their own insurance and they pay extra. And then about 8% of the U.S. does not have insurance. And whenever they need health care, they have to pay for it themselves. Um, and so that is a bit of an issue, whereas in Canada, um, the government provides health care, either the, the country or the province um, provides health care. So anybody can access health care whenever they need it, and they barely have to pay anything. Um, and so obviously, with regards to the patients who are accessing care, seeking care, there's a disparity. Because in the U.S., if you don't have health insurance, if you have partial insurance, you're scared to seek care. You're fearing the bills. You're fearing what is coming after. And oftentimes, you're waiting until it's really serious, and then oftentimes that may result in worse outcomes. Whereas in the US, uh, sorry, whereas in Canada, they have um, some other issues with regards to the fact that Canada is a very large country, and especially with regards to patients who are living in Northern Canada, indigenous populations, et cetera, um, they might have issues with the fact that we live very far from hospitals. And so they're very distinct issues um, where the U.S. also has some remote access issues, but then is also struggling with the financial aspect. And in Canada, they're mostly focused on kind of the remote issues and then um, disparities in, in access for indigenous populations. Now in the, U in the U.S., it's become slightly more of kind of an academic um, kind of question, so to say, in the sense that there's been much research done on um, disparities in healthcare in the U.S. and really which populations are more 
um, facing issues with regards to differential outcomes due to um, unconscious biases, due to disparities in care. Um, but with regards to solutions, there's been really kind of that, that disconnect still. Um, much is still left to be done to actually expand um, health insurance across people who need it. Um, some of you might be aware of kind of the push um, in, in, in recent years or like before um, towards obtaining uh, and establishing Obamacare and then under President Trump kind of impediment of trying to get rid of that. Um, and so that's kind of depending on who's in power in, in, in the US that kind of goes up and down in terms of the expansion or kind of the decrease in terms of insurance coverage. Whereas in Canada, um, they're trying to reconcile much more these days with the fact that indigenous populations have to address these issues. Uh, uh, well, sorry, that they have to address these issues for indigenous populations that can't access care because it's simply impossible to set up an entire specialty care system in any small city in northern Canada. Um, and so what Colombia can learn from that is, is very, uh, is very mixed is that one thing I think is, is very critical is that single payer health system and actually funded or government funded health insurance is critical. Um, I don't think that there's any kind of, um, discussion against that. And I think Colombia to a great extent, as much as I'm familiar with, um, has been, um, has, has been quite a leader in terms of that in, in South America and is uh, continuing to, or at least trying to continue to expand that. But I think you as individual surgeons or trainees or institutions can also look further in terms of, um, similar to kind of the academic questions in the U.S. and then specifically in Canada with regards to, um, specific healthcare acts, trying to see which populations in Colombia are facing these disparities. Is it, people who live in remote Canada? Is it people uh, who are from indigenous um, origins? Is it um, other specific individuals in Colombia? Maybe the elderly, maybe immigrants, maybe um, uh, maybe people who live in a certain part of, of Colombia, a certain region of Colombia, et cetera. I really try and see what are the specific issues that we're facing in Colombia and how can we ensure that the government is addressing that given the fact that the government is increasingly paying attention to it, is increasingly investing in healthcare. So I hope that kind of answered your question in kind of a long-winded manner. Um, but I think, um, I think there's, there's much to do, but also much to build on in terms of where Colombia currently is. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent presentation, Dr. Dominic. Thank you. So yeah, and also, um, oh. I just want to say I'm mindful of the time, but I, I'm happy to stay 10, 15 minutes longer just because I know that my presentation was a bit longer. So if there's any questions, feel free to shoot. Um, hi, good night. My name is Laura Fernandez. Um, hi, Dr. Dominic. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I'm one of the chairs of Incision Colombia, actually, and I just want to highlight the fact that we are all main actors to guarantee um, the global surgery access, and this from our, our like our daily practice, and not only the politicians and not only people that command the health systems, but we as students, as teachers. As like normal students, we we can do something um, on this topic. And also, I would like to add that in countries like Colombia, there are like mm, in Colombia where there has been an armed conflict for many many years. We have to think about an additional variable, which is the violence that makes that the people who are part of these armed group armed groups. Um, they that are actually thousands of them uh they can have access to surgery and even to the health system so we also need to think about this important point and finally we want to i would like to ask you like because since the history of surgery started hundreds and hundreds of years ago it seems like logical to think that taking like to talk about global surgery should have started many 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 years ago and it was only like over 10 years ago that we started to talk about much more about global surgery what do you think is that yeah excellent question and, and first of all thank you for your additions as well laura it's great to to hear you um virtually again um and i want to also 
um, encourage everybody else to, if you haven't um, heard about or read about Incision Columbia, to um, have a look at that because they're doing tremendous work, obviously, in Colombia and getting students involved in global surgery. Um, but to kind of speak a bit more about your specific question, um, so obviously it's been, it's a problem that we've been talk, started talking about global surgery so late. Um, obviously it's better late than never, but um, this should have been done much, much earlier, especially given the fact that all of us at some point in our lives will probably require some form of surgery, whether it's a very minor procedure or it's a very big procedure because we ended up in an accident, some way or another we'll end up having to require surgery. And so if there's no surgery, then obviously you'll notice if you have surgical care, you might not think about it. But unfortunately, given that so many people don't have access to surgical care, you can realize or you can probably quickly see that this is an issue that should have been addressed much earlier. Now, um, as I mentioned um, very briefly on, on kind of the research side, there are a lot of myths where by or because of which people don't necessarily immediately think about um, what the priorities are and what they really should be. We're talking about surgery, and if you don't have insurance that you could pay for surgery, or you're a healthcare administrator or a ministry of health, and you see what people or what hospitals are spending on surgery, you see that one surgical procedure is quickly thousands of dollars. The more invasive, the more expensive, um, the higher the bills will be. Whereas things like mosquito nets, clean water, antibiotics, etc., treating one patient might be much cheaper, preventing one issue might be much cheaper. And so oftentimes people start with that, it's very low hanging fruit. You can buy a mosquito, you can buy antibiotics, you can give it directly. Surgical care, you need to build a hospital, you need to train surgeons, you need to train anesthesiologists, surgery is expensive, et cetera, et cetera. And so the upfront cost is very expensive, the procedural cost is very expensive. And that's where a long time ago, that's where the conversation ended. We saw that antibiotics are cheaper, buy antibiotics. We saw mosquito nets are cheaper, we'll try and prevent malaria, et cetera, et cetera. And that is critical, it's very important. It's kind of low hanging fruits, the quick win, it's very important because infectious diseases are prevalent and we've been able to, we as in the world, has been able to decrease um, infectious disease mortality and, and incidents across the globe in, 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 to a great extent and child mortality has decreased. Um, as a result of better maternal and child health, better sanitation and so forth. And so all of that has been critical. However, when we look at how many lives we're saving with a certain intervention, healthcare intervention, we have to give a lot of people mosquito nets. We have to give a lot of people antibiotics to actually ensure that we're saving a single life. Whereas with surgery, for example, a cesarean section for somebody who has obstructed labor, for example, an open fracture repair for somebody who went into an accident. For, for example, a hernia repair for somebody with incarcerated hernia. You need one intervention to save one life. And so even though it might be very costly for that one intervention, you're immediately saving one life. Whereas you might have to buy a lot of antibiotics, a lot of mosquito nets to also save one life. And so what they realized in recent years is that if we're looking at the entire population, the amount of money that we have to invest to save a certain amount of lives might actually be the same or sometimes even cheaper for surgery than it would be for some other interventions um, that have been shown to also be cost effective but less cost effective in comparison and so kind of that increasing understanding of really what the gaps are but also increased advances in terms of research and, and better understanding how to conduct research what to really look at what policymakers think is important etc um, is that is one big piece of the puzzle so that policymakers can actually see, okay, well, it is a bit harder to invest in surgical care, but eventually the investment will be better. That's very important. Now, the second thing is there are far fewer surgeons than there are primary care specialists, than there are um, maternal health specialists, than there are um, global health researchers at large. The surgical community is relatively small, and so not having the expertise or not necessarily being aware of how to approach policymakers, how to conduct research, maybe not having the time for it if you're living in a low middle income country and you're one of the few surgeons in your hospital, or maybe even your country, it's hard to actually speak up and, and look at what the gaps are because you don't have the time. You're caring for one patient after the other. And then it's very hard to actually put that issue on the table, go to policymakers in the capital, in Geneva, in New York and say, hey, this is an issue. 
Um, and as research kind of expanded, as more trainees got involved, as epidemiologists got involved, health economists got involved, et cetera, they were all able to flesh out um, together in a multidisciplinary collaboration, really, what are those gaps? Where do we need to go? And that's when we started talking about the issue of global survey and really how we can move forward. And I think that's been critical in the past two decades, so we say. The foundation has been laid in the late 20th century, obviously, because of the leadership of a variety of individuals, but it's really been accelerated in, in, in the early 2000s and the early uh, 2010s um, of, of really bringing people together and, and being able to actually look at these different important components. And I think that's why now things are accelerating. Um, and even though 2015 is only six years ago, and even though we only really recently started talking about global surgery, you can see how quickly the field is booming and how quickly that is expanding. And that is because people now realize this is so important. And I think despite the fact that this is late, we have to embrace it and continue this way and ensure that we're kind of picking up um, or catching up with regards to the time that we have lost um, in the years prior and actually continue the way that we're currently going and ensuring that now we can actually address the fact that so many people don't have access to surgical care. So that once we are surgeons, we have less issues with regards to not being able to care for patients. Perfect, thank you so much. Dr. Rebu, I, I, I would like to uh, give you a, a thanks, a big thank you for your presentation and for being here uh, right now with us and share all your experience in global surgery. Um, I would like to um, ask one thing, what, what do you think are, are uh, the points that uh, we must focus uh, to rich um, innovation in, in global surgery in middle to, to low income countries like, uh, like ours. What do you think? Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for the kind words and also for having me. Um, and I think this is a very important question. Um, I think obviously as we are expanding surgical care, we'll notice that some things cannot readily be taken over from how surgery is performed in, for example, the United States or in Europe or in Canada, and just simply bring that to Colombia or bring that to any country in South America or bring that to any country in Sub-Saharan Africa because of a variety of constraints. It might be because finances are not there. It might be because um, the culture is different. Maybe there's different acceptability for certain interventions. Maybe um, people aren't as familiar with technology, with the innovation, with the intervention, whatever it may be. Um, or maybe there's just more suitable alternatives for the context of Colombia or the country that we're speaking about. Um, and so with that comes innovation, really trying to understand what does the local context look like? Do we need a surgical robot? Maybe not. What is it that we really need here? And seeing what could be the solution that's actually addressing that. And I think the COVID-19 pandemic has really forced countries all around the world, even very resourceful centers in, in high-income countries, where in New York, New York was flooded with COVID-19 patients. Um, big cities in high-income countries were flooded with COVID patients, but they didn't have access to masks. They didn't have access to surgical gowns because they were all gone. And so they had to innovate. They had, had to find ways to actually address that. They had to make their own N95 masks. They had to figure out how they could use one ventilator and make it into two ventilators. And these are some of the realities that low and middle income countries are continuously facing because of the fact there's resource constraints, financing constraints, et cetera. Um, and so I think this has kind of spurred more people to think about innovation more broadly. And that's something that can also be applied to surgery to try and understand what might be some of the innovations that you're currently applying that seem very logical to you, but that they aren't applying elsewhere and how can other areas or other countries also implement it. And vice versa, what are some of the things that, for example, they're doing now in, in more resourceful countries and how can you do the same thing with do-it-yourself innovations, with lower cost innovations, with innovations that are cheaper are more suitable for your context and are still able to do the same thing, same outcomes, the same quality, um, but just do it in a way that is slightly different. Um, and so I think um, with regards to surgical innovation, there have been quite a lot of um, innovations that have come up, such as, for example, in cardiac surgery, where they move from very expensive cardioplegia solutions 
to do it yourself, um, cardioplegia solutions for just a few dollars where you're able to actually um, perform cardiac surgery um, in, in a cheaper manner. Uh, at the same time, from a laparoscopy perspective, for example, um, some surgeons in rural India are doing gastro laparoscopy or they're able to do laparoscopic procedures with fewer resources at lower costs and still very high outcomes. At the same time, a lot of low and income countries are facing issues with electricity, et cetera, where during the surgery, suddenly the light drops out. And um, some have solved that by just using a smartphone, whereas others have tried and solved that by having a, a headlight, having a helmet with a light on there, and being, operate, being able to operate that way. And these might not necessarily be the most aesthetically pleasing solutions, but they're functional solutions. They're able to be safely implemented, we're able to conduct safe surgery, and they're applying, they're applicable to the local context, so they can be quickly and, and cheaply scaled. And so I think all of that will ultimately depend on your hospital, your context, your country, your, your resources at hand. Um, but um, resourcefulness and innovation, surgical innovation is really at the core of any kind of global surgery um, care delivery and will ultimately also be, be critical in terms of eventually scaling that and around the world reducing costs as we kind of share those experiences. Amazing answer. Thanks a lot, Dr. Berber. Yes, I, I believe that. I, I hope uh, all our students uh, have hear you and and have uh, in, uh, start this this um, flame of uh, of uh, the initiation of the research in global surgery uh, in our country. I believe that you have started this in, with Incision Colombia, um, and I would like to to. Um, uh, say to you that I would like uh, to r write a paper with you, with our students. If 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 would you like to to allow us to be to have that that honor to uh, perform a publication with you? What do you think? Absolutely, yeah. The honor would be all mine. Um, I'd be very happy to do so, and I, I'm sure that I would learn a lot from all of you. Excellent. I have a, I have a, a few ideas. So I, I will speak with, with uh, Dr. Uh, Laura Cabrera and Dr. Valerie to, to, to uh, send to you the, the, the draft. Thank you. Perfect. No, I don't know you. if, if uh, Dr. Laura Cabrera something, some, some other student have a, a, a Well, uh, thank you again, Dr. Cabrera and Dr. Dominique. So um, thank you again for your time and for such a great presentation, Dr. Dominique. So we're looking forward to the paper and also for more sessions with you. So that was it, guys. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. I'm also, for those who are interested, who had a question and were unable to do so, I'm sharing my email. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, thank you so much for having me. It was a great honor. Uh, it was great to kind of have these engaging discussions and I look forward to the next of these lecture series. Um, and I wish you all the best with, with all of this and obviously the global surgery work that you're doing in Colombia and beyond.